By 1998, Jürgen had produced nine films about the wildlife of Kruger. Now, after several years, Jürgen and his wife, Tarina, return for the first time to their old family home to retrace their footsteps and relive some of the most memorable experiences of their lives. For Jürgen, today is a very special day. He steps out from behind the camera and meets his favorite animal face to face at the lion breeding project of Chukudu, a private game reserve near the Kruger National Park. This is great. I can get so close to the lions and touch them, even play with them. I would never do that with the wild lions of Kruger. If I tried, they would kill me. Jürgen feels that these great cats personify the wilderness and its freedom. A shrinking wilderness now preserved only in unique, untamed parks such as Kruger. As soon as Jürgen and Tarina step through the gates of the Kruger National Park, they'll be in a completely different world where life is wild, untamed and unpredictable. Established more than 100 years ago, the Kruger National Park in the northeastern corner of South Africa is the country's largest and one of Africa's oldest game reserves, covering 2 million hectares, an area larger than Wales. Johan Ulofsa is one of 22 section rangers needed to control such a vast area. But today, he takes time out to welcome his friends back to the world-renowned wilderness that was once their home. Good to see you again. Fantastic to see you, man. Hi, Jürgen. Great to be back. Huh? Welcome back Come to Kruger. Yeah, you guys yeah, yeah I missed you. Huh? I really missed you. It's going to be stop. great to share the bush with you oh, again. Fantastic. You'll find everything has changed, but nothing has changed. Kruger's vast expanse includes numerous ecologically diverse areas of distinct characteristics, varying from dense riverine forest to woodland savannas. Each zone a preferred grazing or hunting ground for the thousands of animals of Kruger. During their 12 years in the park, Jürgen and Tarina lived, filmed and photographed in most of these areas. The outcome? A unique collection of sequences depicting some of the most dramatic events in the lives of the animals of Kruger. Husband and wife grew to know the animals so well through their filming and photography that natural events touched their lives as much as they did the wildlife, the exhilaration of a birth or the sadness of a death and the heart-wrenching despair of a natural disaster. To film wild animals, you have to think like them. You have to know how they will react. But at the same time, you have to survive in their environment. When you're on your own, you have to become part of nature. Living in the bush is like entering another dimension. It doesn't matter who you are out there. Here, you are the weakest species. Easy meat. Big love. Approaching wild animals is not for the faint-hearted, and only an experienced tracker should risk a close encounter with the king of beasts. Alone, armed only with his 16 mm film camera, Jürgen spent years following the animals, a silent observer, never an intruder, recording nature as he saw it. Lions became Jürgen's favorite subjects. They epitomized a power and freedom in the wild which man has lost. Kruger's lion country. For eight years I followed one pride that hunted this area. 
These could be some of the cups that I watched grow, but I don't think they remember me. Jürgen thinks back to 1989, when he first met a very special male, which he named Hanglip. At that time, Hanglip and his brother had just taken over the pride. For the next eight years, Jürgen watched as Hanglip maintained his authority. This is an incredible achievement for a lion. Research shows that most lions rule a pride for no more than four years before being ousted by a younger, more powerful male. When Jürgen first met Hanglip and his pride, the family group was small, with only two males, four adult females, and a few cubs. Under his reign, the pride grew steadily throughout the dry cycle that gripped Kruger Park. Hanglip was a fantastic male, confident of his power, and he accepted me. He allowed me to follow the pride when they went hunting and I was fascinated by the strategies. set up their territories where hunting is best, but not all of Kruger offers an ideal habitat for them. In 1986, when Jürgen and Tarina arrived in Kruger, they were based in the remote northern area of Pafuri. Here there were fewer lions, but the Levuvu River proved to hold other surprises for Jürgen as a filmmaker, as well as Tarina as a mother. Being the wife of a wildlife filmmaker is a completely different life um, from being your own person one becomes a person that follows another person's dream and it depends on whether you enjoy that or not I really enjoy being part of a dream I enjoy being in the bush um, I found that when the kids came um, it became a little bit more difficult sometimes I would take my son out filming with me it was great I loved having my family with me in the bush Life was good, but these were times of change, and a frightening shadow loomed overhead. Animals is one thing. One can be scared of those. But people are different. People with AK-47s hold a totally different threat. In the late 1980s, this remote area of South Africa, bordering Zimbabwe and Mozambique, provided an ideal, unprotected entry for freedom fighters. They came at night, on foot. The scariest part for me in the bush was when we were huddled around the fire at night and we knew they were out there. We heard gunfire. There was nothing we could do. We were totally vulnerable. Of course there were risks, living with a family in this area. But if wildlife filmmakers only work where political situations are perfect, they would never make films. Now, 12 years later, the political situation has calmed, but life in the park continues as always. Some of the cycles are as predictable as the passing of the seasons, while others as unpredictable as a wild animal. Today, Jürgen instinctively applies all the lessons he learned while living in this untamed environment. He's confident that some things never change. To find the action, he looks for tracks in the sand by the river. In the wild, you can never let your guard down. Jürgen moves in close. Four. 
three meters from the jaws. From experience, he judges that this would be a safe distance to film, close enough to get a good shot, but far enough not to be attacked. The river is full now, but back in 88 it was a different story. The river had stopped flowing and the animals had to come down to drink at the last remaining puddles. Here I could film some exceptional behavior. <coughs> There was danger everywhere. The animals had to come to the water. They had to take the risk. One in particular seemed to epitomize the struggle for life. I was amazed that the little antelope had survived the attack. The next day I was surprised to see it back again. It was desperate for water. After that, I never saw it again. It was most probably taken by lions. The lions seemed to know the dangers and dug deeper into drinking holes already made by elephants. But others were still forced to go down to the drying river. For some to survive, others had to die. There were so many crocodiles crowded in the small pool. The two large males got into a fight for dominance. It was like watching the clash of the titans, a battle to the death. Jürgen watched in astonishment as the other crocodiles moved in without hesitation to eat the loser, proving that in nature, nothing goes to waste. After two years in Pafuri, Jürgen had captured the unique beauty and stark reality of this region. The resulting film helped to save the area from being exploited for coal mining. With his first film in the can, it was time to move on, further south, to a different part of Kruger. In 1988, Jürgen and his family moved to Skukuza, where the children started school. His favorite spot in this area was Chokwane, an area of open plains and woodland savanna, lion country. And this was where he met his favorite lion, Hanglip. This was Hanglip's hunting ground. Here I joined him and his pride in the never-ending search for prey. Jürgen started to film these lions at the time when Hanglip and his brother first took over the Shilawene pride. Hanglip was the stronger of the two males, but together they formed a formidable partnership that kept rivals at bay. In the time I spent with him, Hanglip fathered many cubs. Ow. Ow. 
Despite the years of drought, Hanglip's cubs continued to flourish, growing healthy and strong. Lions can subsist for long periods of time without drinking by using the moisture present in their prey. And prey was plentiful. This is where I had my camp. There are no lions here today. But back then, I would sometimes come home and find lions lying in the shade of my tent. Then I would wait until they moved away. They had accepted me in their territory, so I accepted them too. I was truly living with lions. I had Hanglip and his family's whole history in my camera. The more time I spent with them, the more they accepted me. I was just like one of the pride. A unique opportunity presented itself when Hanglip mated with one of his females. Over the next 106 days, Jürgen followed her pregnancy. One day, she did not join the rest of the pride when they left to go hunting. I knew her time was near. Later that day, she moved into a dense patch of reeds. It was exciting for Jürgen, but at the same time frustrating. He could not see the birth. All he could do was record the sounds. Jürgen desperately wanted to see the cubs, but he knew that if he got too close, the mother would kill him. Jürgen waited at the den for four long days. Eventually, hunger forced the lioness to leave her cubs unattended, and Jürgen saw his chance. I crawled into the den with my camera, and I said to myself, Jürgen, if she comes back now, you're dead. But I had to go in. I felt like they were part of my own family. The cubs were very small, only weighing about two kilograms each. But their eyes were already open, and they knew that Jürgen was not their mother. They started hissing at me. I knew if their mother heard them, I would be in big trouble. I had to get out of there fast. I got out just in time before she arrived back. I'm sure she could smell that I'd been with the cubs, but her first instinct was to check if they were okay. Whenever something special would happen with Hanglip's pride, he would come fetch me and he'd take me there. And when the cubs were out of hiding, I saw them and they were absolutely beautiful. After about six weeks, 
the lioness joined another female with cubs slightly older than hers. Then, Jürgen could film without any danger of being attacked and spend as much time as possible recording the family's activities. The lionesses were attentive mothers, but they had to eat to survive, and every two or three days, they had to hunt. During their first two months, the cubs were too young to follow their mothers, who would have to leave them behind, alone and unguarded until they found someone they could trust. They would get ready at night to go hunting, but sometimes the mother would bring the cubs over and leave them with me. Jürgen had unwittingly become a nanny. It was a great privilege, but it had its drawbacks. I was a Helen. I wanted to film the excitement of the hunt, but I felt responsible for the cubs, and so I stayed with them. The next morning, when the mothers returned, it was like a family reunion. Whenever Jürgen was not with Hanglip's Pride, he kept an eye out for other filming opportunities. He sometimes followed other lions and the animals that shared their territory. This young bull elephant was determined to let everyone know who was boss around here. with everyone, even Jürgen. The elephant came from behind a small tree and mock charged me. He had nothing against me personally. He was just telling me to go away. I realized then that I was parked under his favorite tree. Incidents like this one, which he filmed in 1991, deepened Jürgen's understanding of the animals and their behavior. They are invaluable lessons which he has never forgotten and ones that he must use again every time he returns to the bush. Useful skills if he is to come face to face with one of Africa's big five. I believe animals are just like us, just another tribe. To understand them, we have to learn their language. Over the years alone with them in the bush, they have taught me when I should back off and when I can stay. Sorry I disturbed his midday sleep, but I love this, just like the old days. As Jürgen learned to understand the wild animals of Kruger, he became familiar with the park's annual cycles. 
His quest to record one of the most interesting stories took him into the Mopane Belt, a vast area of scrubland covered mainly by one kind of tree, the Mopane. This hardy tree adapts easily to the harsh conditions of the area and is central to the lives of many of the inhabitants of Kruger. Lions use these trees for shade, but they're not what draws Jürgen back to this area. Without hesitation, he homes in on exactly what he's looking for. Perfectly camouflaged among the leaves, a Mopani moth, an insect whose entire life cycle is centered around this tree. Can you see how worn her wings are? That means she has finished laying her eggs. She'll die soon. It's not only the big animals that make up the wonders of Kruger. Insects are equally important here. I wanted to record their lives too. Jürgen's unique footage revealed an amazing life cycle never before seen on film. The adult moth has no feeding organs. Her entire purpose is to mate and then lay about 200 eggs. Her life lasts no longer than three days. Tiny caterpillars hatch between three and four weeks later. They only need to crawl a short distance to find their food source, Mopani leaves. The brightly colored caterpillar is a feeding machine growing rapidly to a length of up to 13 centimeters. Its skin does not stretch with its expanding body. The caterpillar needs to molt six times before it reaches full size. By this stage, the caterpillar becomes one of the richest sources of protein for animals and birds. After six weeks of blissful overindulgence, the caterpillar leaves the tree and finds a soft, sandy spot in the soil near the base of the Mopani. It burrows down into the sand, where it hollows out a cell and gradually turns into a pupa. Here it will lie as it goes through its dramatic transformation. No one could tell me exactly when the moss would come out, so I had to be there every night to make sure I didn't miss it. But I wasn't alone out there. A kill among the Mopani trees brought on rivalry among the king of beasts. But Jürgen maintained his vigil. After almost six months, the newly formed moths emerged, and Jürgen was ready to record the event. Now that I'd seen the whole cycle, I was amazed at the ability of this one insect to transform itself. It just shows that everything in nature, no matter how small, is determined to beat the odds to survive. I find that fantastic. The life cycle of the Mopani moth was only one of the incredible events of the Kruger Park. Now, Jürgen knows that he has only scratched the surface. To film and understand the complexity and diversity of this world would take many lifetimes. He was privileged enough to share very special moments with some of Kruger's most formidable inhabitants. Retracing his old paths, he meets an old friend. This is a real privilege. Mabarule is one of the grand old men of Kruger. More than 40 years old, he is one of Kruger's seven big tuskers.
Mabarule is here to cool off. In summer, temperatures often reach a baking 40 degrees Celsius. I'm not used to this heat anymore. I need to cool off as well. Like all the animals in the bush, Jürgen had to adapt to the extreme heat and had to find some inventive means to cool down. Just like the old days, he returns to one of his favorite swimming pools. I almost landed in trouble in 92. I was taking a swim when a huge head suddenly appeared over the top of the reservoir. An elephant bull had come to drink and I couldn't get out. I hung out to the pipe in the middle for over an hour and hoped that he wouldn't find out I was there. During the driest months, the man-made dams of Kruger become the lifeline for many of the animals. Shiloweni is one of the biggest. Fed by the summer rains, it usually retains enough water to last through the dry months. But Jürgen recalls that it was not always so. This is one of my favorite spots, but in the drought, it was just a little puddle. 1992 saw the worst drought in Kruger in living memory. The first animals to suffer were the resident hippos. Jürgen watched as the water shrank around them. The last of the muddy water drew many animals to the dam. The only ones not to feel the effects of the drought were the lions. In fact, they thrived. Hanglip's pride had grown into a formidable hunting unit, 28 strong. They needed to hunt every day to keep the pride well fed. During this period, they literally lived around the dam, waiting for an opportunity to strike. constant game of survival. The prey animals knew that the lions were lying in wait and they tried their best to counter every ambush. While the lions thrived in these conditions, the hippos were really suffering. There was not enough water to cover their sensitive skins. Having finished all the grazing closest to the water, they were starving and some even resorted to eating elephant dung. I watched as one hippo calf moved away from the herd in search of food. of the hippos was incredible. The lion seemed as surprised as I was. Tolerance levels diminished, all fighting for the last remaining drops of water. The dry years and the inferior grazing had weakened these old warriors. And the lions were there, ready to attack at every opportunity. Oh! <laughs> 
This epic battle between predator and prey lasted for more than two hours. It could have gone either way until the very last moment. I felt sorry for the buffalo. He fought bravely, but he had had a good life. I couldn't help it. My heart was with Hanglip and his pride. I was always amazed by Hanglip's power. But the battle with the old bull took its toll. After this, he could still hunt, but he limped for the rest of his life. Throughout the drought years in the early 1990s, Hanglip and his pride grew in strength. They thrived when all other animals around them suffered. But then, Jürgen remembers, came a threat that spared no one, not even the lions. This threat was microscopic, a spore-forming bacterium that can live for centuries in soil and bones. It survives in the harshest of conditions, a killer bacterium, anthrax. In 1991, the dry, hot winds of the drought put the habitat and the animals of Kruger under severe stress. The herds churned up dormant anthrax spores. It was a time bomb waiting to explode. The anthrax infected the weakened animals, entering their bodies through wounds and scratches in their mouths caused by feeding on the tough, dried out vegetation. The animals were desperate. As grazing deteriorated and water holes dried up, competition for food and water turned into physical battles. The weakest didn't stand a chance. This zebra was kicked to death by its rival, a victim in the struggle for survival. As the anthrax spread, ulcers became my guide to infected carcasses. I still remember the terrible stench of death. Park rangers and personnel could do nothing. Although there was a vaccine against anthrax, it was impossible to vaccinate all the animals in the reserve. Teams would follow the vultures to the carcasses. All they could do was to take blood samples to confirm the cause of death. The disease was spreading quickly. Even the largest animals in the park had no defense against the devastating power of the anthrax. With vaccination out of the question, the park officials burnt all the carcasses they could find to curb the spread of the disease. But Kruger is an enormous park with thousands of hectares of remote land. It was impossible to find all the carcasses. The scavengers could smell death miles away. No carcass was left untouched, and slowly these scavengers were infected too. The anthrax bacterium does not die with the animal. The meat remains infected, sure to infect all those who eat it.
what seemed like a feast for the scavengers and predators was actually a death warrant. The anthrax outbreak was a terrible time for me. I saw my friends eating infected carcasses. I knew they might die, but there was nothing I could do to save them. As the disease developed in the animals, the swelling of their mouths, heads and throats made it more and more difficult for them to breathe. Scratch marks in the ground bore silent witness to the animal's desperate struggle for air during the last moments of life. I had seen my lions at their peak, at the top of the food chain, but over two seasons everything just seemed to fall apart. Those that were found were put out of their misery by the rangers. But then, just as I thought all was lost, the rains came, and the drought was broken at last. Floodwaters, the only force that has the power to stop anthrax, wash the spores downstream and into the sea, where the salt water eventually destroyed the bacteria. Incredibly, not all life was lost. The young and healthy survived. Much was learned during that anthrax outbreak, and today researchers see anthrax as nature's own culling mechanism. During times of drought, when the animals and their habitat are under severe stress, anthrax cleanses the land of the sick and the weak. The most important thing for me was that my old friend Hengdip had survived, and he was still in charge. After 10 years of drought, Kruger now started a time of good rains and rebirth. This time of well-being continues even today, during Jürgen and Tarina's visit. And the best way to see how well Kruger is doing is from the air. Nature is fantastic. It recovers so quickly. Not a trace of the dramas that played themselves out here during the drought. The river is full now. Back then, many had stopped flowing. Good rains mean that there's plenty of grazing and the impala population flourishes. People don't take much notice of impalas because there are so many of them but they're amazing animals, perfectly adapted to their world. During his 12 years in Kruger, Jürgen was determined to film an impala birth. After many failed attempts, he finally succeeded in following a heavily pregnant female as she distanced herself from the herd. I really struggled to film this birth because impalas are very cautious and secretive. While I filmed, it reminded me of the birth of my children. Life is the same for all of us. Impala ewes give birth just after the first rains, but if the rains are late, some people believe that they're able to delay birth for up to a month. This could give their lambs a better chance of survival. Of all the unique footage that you've shot, I think, to me, the most special one is the one for the Impala birth in that field of flowers. I mean, it's wonderful. 
This vulnerable baby with this vast, wild wilderness surrounding it and all the dangers in it. I could relate to that, having raised my own children in the same environment. There are dangers everywhere. That spring was a very prolific time for most of the animals of Kruger. And Jürgen was lucky. Soon after he captured the Impala birth on film, he recorded a wildebeest's first moments of life. The difference between the two births is that wildebeest cows stay within the herd, relying on the protection of the group against predators. The herd is constantly on the move, and the mother and the other adults nudge the calf to make it walk as soon as possible. After only five minutes, it is ready to move with the herd. Jürgen and Tarina relive fond memories, but their visit to Kruger has almost come to an end. Once again, they meet up with Johan. Hey, Jürgen, how are you doing today? All right, nice. Hi, Tarina. Have you seen the line yet? Yes, I did. Nice try of 12. Two bit of a two k's up the track. Oh, thanks a lot, then. Good Hi, Tarina. Enjoy. For one last time, Jürgen and Tarina spend a few quiet moments with Kruger's new generation of lions. These seem as healthy as the pride they once knew. The pride led by Hanglip, a fighter, a survivor. We grew old together here, like two old lions. My old friend has gone now. I will never forget him. He survived through drought, injury, and anthrax. I don't know how he died, but I do know that he lived like a true king. I hope his last battle was a good one. During my 12 years in this park, I saw many sides of nature. I saw royal battles, and I saw death in all its forms. But I also saw how wonderful life can be. For a while, the animals in Kruger allowed me into their world. I was a part of it all. I will always be thankful for the opportunity that I had to live my dream. to leave now, but a part of me will always be here, living with lions. <laughs>